two, talk the talk, calling all activists and allies alike. It's time to come together and demand the changes we need in this unjust world. I'm Jordan, a black male activist. And I'm Caitlin, a white female ally. Together we created Talk the Talk, a platform for speaking candidly and constructively on race. We're gonna provide you the starting points for uncomfortable but meaningful conversations and introduce new knowledge and perspective. We'll arm you with the tools necessary to combat racism anywhere and anytime you experience it. Right now is a once in a lifetime opportunity to create the lasting change to racial and social injustices in America. We challenge you to do your part Join us and talk the talk. All right, Caitlin, here we are, episode one of Talk the Woo! Talk. What is we're up? doing? I get, I get a couple housekeeping things out the way for sure. Um, first off, I don't know if the two of us had ever had a conversation without a couple four-letter words being dropped. So this is our parental guidance uh, disclosure right here. We will probably swear at some point so there like are colorful language yes, just yes. Call the conversation we get a little more vibrant get the yeah picture. it's like more emotive you know what we mean when we say it <laughs> and <laughs> so if you are listening now hopefully you listen to episode zero our trailer episode uh it was a quick uh around eight nine minutes and that kind of kicked off what this podcast is going to be about we're going to give you a little bit more info um before we really hop into today's question and getting that question answered. So, Caitlin, with that being said, who are you? What else, what do we need to know about Caitlin Floyd? Wow, yes. So, um, Caitlin Floyd, that is my name. Um, I grew up in the South, went to school in the South, and Jordan and I met um, when I moved to Philadelphia for school. Nope. Why did I move there? <laughs> for a job. I don't know what, to, it's like quarantine, COVID, like my brain's on another yeah. planet quickly. Yeah. Um, and Jordan and I became friends because we realized like through the workplace and hanging out a couple times. Well, actually, no, I overextended my welcome at Jordan's birthday. It was like a <laughs> passing like, hey, do you want to come to this birthday party of mine? And I stayed for hours after <laughs> everyone else had left. Um, Cause that's- Well, we I knew it was real. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when I was there helping clean up, um, <laughs> actually still, and by clean up, I mean drinking the rest of the alcohol that was yep. left over. Yeah, the alcohol, yep. Yes. Um, no, but we came to realize that we see the world in pretty similar ways and have a lot of hopes for what America can look like um, and realize that we're at a deficit right now. Like, I think unless you're hiding under a rock, we can all kind of agree things are not good and have not been good. Um, and like the nice thing, like Jordan mentions it in our intro, like the nice thing is that and the silver lining to all of this, like shit just piling on top of us is like at least more people are waking up and understanding and being empathetic and seeing that they can make a change um and that's how we became friends i think we're just align on a lot of things and can have really fun deep conversations and we come from two completely different worlds um but there's a lot of empathy and respect between one another. Um, and I think that's what makes these conversations fun. I will caveat all of this to say that neither Jordan or I are experts. Like we are just living life. Um, like everyone is. Um, so we don't have all the answers. We may not always have the right answers. Like I don't speak for everyone. Um, like I don't speak for every Southern white woman. Like that would be, <laughs> I, I know myself and that would be a lot. <laughs> like he, there's only one of me and that's a good thing. Um, so please Mental. don't. To echo that, I don't speak for all black men, all black people. I have my black experience and everyone will have their own. Um, and as far as who I am, like Caitlin said, we became good friends four years ago. Caitlin crashed my birthday party and stayed. <laughs> um, she mentioned we met here in Philly, which is my adopted hometown at this point. Lived and grew up about an hour from here. At right outside of Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, actually ended up buying a house around the corner from where my dad grew up, uh, down here in Philly. So, um, yeah, so we're friends. We've been friends. We'll continue to be friends. And we don't know everything. Um, but we're going to create this platform. It's going to be used to create a community where people use what we talk about as a jumping off point, an educational uh, tool to dig even deeper once you're done listening to each episode um, and taking it from there. 
So we know what the podcast is about. We know who we are. We know how we know each other. We know that we don't know everything. So what we do know is that we're yeah, what do we know? <laughs> we're going to try to answer a question today, just like we will on every episode. Um, this episode um, is going to lay the groundwork based on the topic that we're discussing today. It's going to lay the groundwork for every other episode because it is starting off with how race became what it is in America and how America, in fact, came to be what it is. Um, we're answering the question, but wasn't slavery a long time ago? Very big question, broad question. We were going through trying to get ready for this episode. It's, it's taken us a while because this could be a seven week course on how slavery has impacted America. Um, so again, wasn't slavery a long time ago? Question mark is today's question. And you're going to see how it impacts housing discrimination, how it impacts education, educational disparities, how it impacts our employment, how it impacts healthcare, and how it impacts policing. Just to name five quick things off the top that are parts of everyday life and are still 401 years later after 1619 when the first slaves reached America. 401 years later, we're still having the impact. So yes, slavery was 401, it started 401 years ago and it was abolished in 1865, but we still see the remnants and the effects and the impacts on a very, very daily basis. So those are all ways that we see those um, impacts manifest into daily life and we're going to go ahead and kick through um, the history and why slavery became a thing, how it stayed a thing for so long and how it eventually ended and then we'll get to modern day. So Caitlin, you are our in-house historian. <laughs> That's a very generous term. I'm like, oh my god. That's a, people get PhDs for like what we're going to spend like 60 minutes talking about like they spend their entire life's work like learning and disseminating this information so so let's <laughs> do it so, oh wait it takes you seven years to get your phd it's fine we only need an hour it's okay yeah. All right, we'll give you the abbreviated crash course version the talk yes. talk phd yes okay so to echo jordan's point wasn't slavery a long time ago we first need to take several steps back to look at what is slavery and how did it get started in America? Um, and so one thing that Jordan and I were going through and looking at is slavery was created because of like an economic need, right? Um, we need to go back to thinking about what the world looked like in the 15, 1600s. Like how did people like earn money? Like what was wealth? Um, and what did that look like? Um, I will also say that all of this is very like Eurocentric um, because that's where we're coming from with America, our ties to Europe. Um, so I'm not speaking for everywhere else in the world, but land was money. And that was how you became successful. Like how much land you had dictated your status and wealth. Um, and during the 15, 1600s, everyone was like, we need to go get more land. So countries like England, France, Spain, Portugal, um, we're going around the world trying to get, trying to make like passageways, passages to Asia, India, so they could go get luxury goods. They wanted more land. They wanted luxury goods that they were introduced to. Um, and America was discovered. Update, it was not discovered by Christopher Columbus. He discovered like Haiti. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other thing, but like, let's let's keep those. That's uh, a whole other thing, but like just so we know, America was eventually discovered, and land was taken from the native people. They're like, Collins were like, yeah, cool. This is our land now. Um, because we say so. Because like For no other stick reason. A, stick a flag in the ground. It's my, dibs. It was literally the dibs before dibs was a thing. Um, and the interesting thing too is like a lot of the folks that were going to America were not like the Europeans were not like richy rich people. Um, these were people who didn't have economic opportunity because they were like the seventh kid and like 
land parcels for their family land were not, um, like they just weren't going to get an inheritance basically. So like, well, I'll go my own way or they were coming from religious oppression. Um, so these are not, you know, Richie Rich people. The Royals. Of yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, Meghan Markle was not coming here, unfortunately. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun though? Um, so they're coming here and they realize like, there's no gold. That was the original goal was like, let's find gold. There's gold everywhere. We all saw Pocahontas. It's inaccurate, but they didn't find gold, but they found land and they said, okay, great. Let's I'm make sure money. money. Yes. Agriculture is how we make our money. Cool. 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 Well, who's going to work this land? Oh my God. There's so much of it. Like we can't do this all ourselves if we want to turn a profit. So we had indentured servitude, which um, basically was for people from Europe to come and get their passage paid to come to America and then say, okay, great. Like if I were like a single gal that was never going to get married um, and Jordan was like, hey, I've got some land in America, I'll pay your passage if you have to like work for me for seven years. I'd be like, okay, there's nothing for me here in London. I'm going to peace out Girl Scout and go do that. Right. That was fine and worked for a while until they realized, listen, like this is getting kind there's of- There's a cheaper way to do this. There's a cheaper way to do there's this. There's a cheaper, AKA free way to do this. Yeah. I, yes. So they're like, just kidding. Oh my gosh. These Portuguese people have slaves. All of a sudden, 1619, Jordan mentioned it. The first slaves came onto the shores of America. I'm like, this is free. Why are we doing this? Like, why are we paying, you know, these Europeans who want to, like, who have every right to stop because we have a contract with them that says, after seven years, I'm free to go. Why, why, there's people that we can just take and we can work them for forever. So you, and not you, said, you said people, but they didn't look at, but, yeah. Slaves, okay. black slaves okay. as as people they looked at us as property. as property so it was hey here's this free property that we'll, we'll purchase up front but we never have to do anything else for these people that we look at as property or as cattle um that are going to and create going to go and create all of this wealth so when people say that america was built on the backs of slaves like it's not hyperbolic it is not an exaggeration it is 100% what happened. Free slave labor is what built this country to what it is today. Um, so if you, like, when you look at the economics of that, the way that plays out is you're taking this land that you took from the Native Americans, you're taking black people from Africa, bringing them here and using them to work that land that you took for free, and you're using them as free labor to create a product whichever that product was. Uh, for a while it was more agricultural and later it does become cotton, which is what, you know, when you connect the slave trade, the first thing that a lot of people think of is cotton because that was, instead of money, like that was the, instead of oil, that was the way to make money. It was oh, yeah. the oil of the early 1600s, 1700s, 1800s. And once people, white colonizers realized that, that they could take that cotton and sell it back to the people in Portugal, back to the people in England, back to people in Spain and France, all over Europe and honestly the rest of the world. That is what they went all in on. So that was the biggest driving factor of wealth. And that was built by people, black people who were enslaved and giving nothing, like given less than nothing um, for, for centuries. And that's right. how the country got to be the global economic power and, you know, overall power as far as a nation compared to everywhere else. So you, like, it's not hyperbolic again to say that America was built on the backs of slaves. So continue. Yeah. No, no, I think you bring up a really good point on the, the emphasis on cotton. Like, I think if we like walk, which like, we're not going to walk around and talk to people because COVID, but if we went up to people on the street today and like asked general questions about about slavery like what they think like i firmly believe that most of them would say like it's in their head they picture a very large plantation in the south with cotton and that's not inaccurate 
Um, but I think there's an interesting point too, like to the further pow like power behind the economics of slavery and like why it was a thing and we're still seeing the ripple effects and the ramifications of, of slavery in our country today is to the point of like, okay, yeah, we're gonna farm this land, we're gonna make money. For a very long time, the way to make money was things like tobacco and like growing up in North Carolina, I mean like, if you go out into Eastern North Carolina, you can still see like a bunch of tobacco farms. Like North Carolina for a very long time, into like the 70s and 80s still got a lot of their money from tobacco so tobacco was a big one um when you think like down, when i was talking about christopher columbus like down in the caribbean it was like sugar cane yeah how, how, how are you getting your your rum things like that sugar cane um but in the late 1700s the cotton gin was invented right check i can't remember 1793 I don't know. Historian, you're supposed to know this. <laughs> yeah, I was like, like, you know, it, like, I'm like Googling it because now I feel bad. I did know it, but off the top of my head, now I'm questioning myself. 94. Okay. Eli Whitney, it was 94. Great. 1794. I just, I feel bad now. Whoops. Maybe we can edit that out. Or no, actually do it because like this, look, we're learning. It's, it's a whole thing. It's dynamic. Yeah. Um, so the cotton gin was invented. And that flipped the switch because the reason that tobacco was super popular as a, a, a product, I guess is the best way to describe it. Was it was the, way to, the way to paint this picture is if you want to take those commodities, so sugar cane, tobacco, cotton, and you want to place them into today's world. Like if you put on CNBC or any news channel, and you see the stock market, the tickers for oil, especially going up and down based on what else is going on in the economy. If that's what would happen if we had those same tools and metrics back in these slave times, like as the price of oil went up, it was supply and demand. So when price of oil goes up, that means that the demand has gone up, the supply has gone down. And it's just the same thing that happened with all of these commodities that were created by slave work. And it's exactly what Caitlin's about to go into when she talks about how a cotton gin put the production and manufacturing and selling of cotton at the forefront and became the biggest driver for slavery continuing. Right, so tobacco easy, like you pull the leaf, you dry the leaf, it was used for smoking. Big thing great that was a, a large export for the colonies um there were people who grew cotton but the way cotton grows it's got all these little seeds you think about a cotton ball like if you're using it for like cosmetic purposes or whatever there's like little seeds in there so imagine having to pull out and rip out the seeds it's just it takes a long time it wasn't very fruitful in terms of like large mass scale production so to jordan's point the cotton gin was invented and it made it so much easier to mass produce cotton. It was quicker, it was easier. Um, it ripped the seeds out. It was just literally, think of it in the same likeness of the impact that like Ford had on like the assembly line, um, which again, maybe I'm being like super nerdy, but Ford basically said, great, like we can make one car at a time and it'll take all day for one person to do, or we can have every single person specialize in something and put things together. And they were knocking out cars, that's why Ford is one of the greatest car companies in like American history. Similar thing where like now, oh, holy shit, like we can make so much, sorry, we cussed already. <laughs> of course it was me first. Like we can make so much more cotton now and everyone's using cotton. Like it's for your clothes. It's for your bedding. Like we all use cotton even still today, like all the time. Um, and so when that happened, more and more people were like, well, let me get into this cotton game. Like I want, I want in. I've got a little bit of money. Let me try to do this. Let me get some help. And by help, I mean like, let me own a person to, right. to do this for me. Um, and that continued to perpetuate slavery into the 1800s. Um, I think the one thing to note too is the difference in economies between like the North and the South um, of the US and that's starting to differentiate itself. Um, so like when we talked about it, everyone came here and they're like, cool, cool, cool. Like we need to have land. 
we, and we're going to make money off that land. Um, the South became much more agricultural than the Northeast. Don't get me wrong. There was still stuff going on in the Northeast. There were still farms, but it was never as industrialized as like what right. was in the South. Um, which slowly led to some, as, as we get through like the American revolution that leads to some states and like a more of a practice in the Northeast of like not using slaves. It wasn't always that like people in the Northeast were like abolitionists or like what we would today be like anti-racist. Like, it had to do with like the, their economy here in the Northeast right. was not built around the slave trade. So they were, they became in, indifferent for the most part, as opposed to being radically against it. They were just indifferent to slavery. Right. It's they, literally they, like, it's the argument of being anti-racist or just like not a piece of shit. Like, like, you know, like right now we're at a time where like, it's very evident who of your friends and family and colleagues are anti-racist and those who are just like, not really saying a ton. Yeah. Think like the same type of thing. Like there, and don't get me wrong, there were some people who were anti slavery and like anti racist saying, like, this of is course. like, what are we doing? Of what, what I mean, that's the only way that we got to this point where there's right. not slavery. <laughs> right. So, and like, I think that's a pretty clear demarcation uh, uh, and like a point in history where like, okay, the South is starting to make some serious bank now. We've got the cotton gin. We still need these people. Sorry. What I see is people, they saw this property, like, we still need this land worked. Like, it's super important. We're going to keep this going. Whatever. Mm -hmm. I didn't remember exactly. that. But <laughs> well, no, it, it, you're, you're relating what started off as economics around the slave trade to how that started to have a geopolitical difference between the North and the South. I mean, your economy starts to like forcibly construct what your geography is and what the policies are in that geography. So like it was, there were processes and systems and laws put in place that kept slavery alive. So slaves were not allowed to learn to read or write. Read or write. So if you're not allowed to read or write, you, especially back then, you don't know what's going on anywhere outside of your immediate sphere because you can't read about it. There's not Instagram to go on and check your story. There's not um, Google to check anything on your phone. Like a phone wasn't even a thing. Like there was no way to get the information. It was very easy to keep information out of slaves' hands. So it was impossible for slaves to really know anything other than what they were forced into. Like right. they didn't, if you go back to representation, they didn't have representation. They didn't have education. They didn't have any of the tools to get themselves out of that situation. At best, they knew that there was a better situation for them in the North. So they would try to escape. And if, if that, if that escape failed, like either killed, beat, sold to a different owner in a different part of the world of, of the U.S. away from your family, like, there were, there were no rights. And that was not by chance that was strategically planned out. The food that they were fed was food that you wouldn't feed a dog today. It was literally the leftovers, the scraps, the very bottom of the barrel. Um, they were not allowed to own property. They were not given pay. They were not even allowed to stick with their families. They were sold to and from different plantations with no regard of, of their family or where their kids would go or where their husband or wife would be, they weren't even legally allowed to be married. So you wanna talk about processes and laws that were strategically put in place to keep a system alive. Like we talk about that all the time now with um, the systemic racism in America. It's not new, <laughs> it's as old, if not older than the country is. So yeah. that's how you connect the economy, the geography and the policies all back to slavery in that time. Yeah, I think like one last point before we move on is like you talk about like the family unit. I think the other thing that like is so hard to like wrap your head around in terms of like, at least for me, when I think of like the scale of like what this was, because obviously like 
when you look back and you're reading history books, like that's obviously it's awful. And like growing up in the South, like you hear about it, all this kind of stuff. The thing that's really shocking to me is the numbers of people. When you talk about the family. So now remember, remember in 1619, there were 20 slaves 20, in that place. 20. 20. When you talk about not being able to be married, being taken away from your children, all that kind of stuff. Again, playing to the economics of like, once someone owned a person, they paid for them, right? They let, you know, they weren't allowed to be, like slaves weren't allowed to be married, but they were encouraged to have children for sure, mm -hmm. right? And they're like, incur like a, if a person was to own another person, like they were encouraged to like procreate women were sexually abused and assaulted. It was, it was to, grow, to grow your investment. Right, exactly. Oh, like, yes. it just, like, those numbers to me, when you start from 20 to the mil, like, you know, to, that's just, like, it, like, out of control. <laughs> like, exactly. I understand it happened. It's just, and then, <laughs> I just put it into the context of, like, the town that I grew up in, or, like, your hometown, your whatever, like imagine just like the town that you grew up in, and unless like you're in like New York, then I guess it really wouldn't apply <laughs> because New York is so big. But like, just think about like your community and every single person in your community being owned. And like, when I think about it in that type of scale, like it just paints a clear picture for me, you know, like it's just out of, it's just mind blowing to me that it was a thing. And like, it makes sense too that it happened for so long when there are that many people, unfortunately, that have had their rights and liberties stripped away mm -hmm. or never even been. Given and and them. also that there were so many people that were benefiting from it. Like, yes, you can't leave that out when you're talking about why it lasted for so long because there was such a large financial benefit to so right. many people and so right. many generations that are still benefiting today. So like we talk like. When you talk, look, I feel like I feel like we skipped over how fucking atrocious and terrible slavery was, and I don't want that to go as something that we didn't discuss. Like we, yeah, like it's not an afterthought. We, all, we should all agree that slavery was really, really bad. It's crazy right. enough that there are people who who don't believe that, but I doubt that those people are listening. We all so if you found this, years. like, yeah, you that's, probably, that's a high level of, like, internet searching, but, like, uh, that's scary. <laughs> right. You're probably, you're probably not seeking us out. But no. <laughs> we do want to, before we keep going any further, we, we do know that slavery was the worst thing that has ever happened to me in this entire planet. Like, in the history of the world, slavery in America is the most lasting sin. It was America's original sin, and I don't want that to be missed out on how terrible the situation was we did want to just make sure we hit the economics the geography and the political impacts that slavery had before we move into how did it eventually end because thankfully it did end um the motives behind why it ended might not be as pure and true as we would have wished they were um but it did end up ending through the civil war which probably learned that the civil war was about slavery and ending slavery and abolishing slavery, which was part of it, but a big part of a bigger part of it when it was happening was about keeping the union together. So keeping the South from seceding from the union. And I mean, slavery ending was part of the argument and the disagreements there, but it wasn't what the Union Army set out to end and abolish. They set out to keep the southern states as part of the union. So, I mean, you're the historian. You want to give us some more context? Yeah. So, we talk about how slavery came to America. We get through, we talk about, like, the economic boom. We're now in the 1800s. Um, the transatlantic slave trade ends in the early 1800s people around the world are like, this is fucked up. Like, we're not doing this. But unfortunately, like we mentioned a little earlier, that didn't change anything within the Americas because at that point the system of slavery was already here. It was they already it was already here. It was already there. Anywhere. Didn't need to make the expensive long journey 
back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean. That was no longer a necessary thing. Like that dangerous, horrible, horrible, just like the most disturbing thing you could possibly think of is that those slave ships going back and forth. There was so much loss of life. I mean, it just like heart, heart wrenching is like putting it mildly. Um, so that ended, which is, I mean, like, it's like one of those like slow claps where you're like, Oh my God, like we're congratulating you for not being as like a shitty person. Like that we're not rewarding like that, like mediocre behavior here or like baseline human decency. Like what? Okay. Whatever. Um, but by that point there were already so many people who were owned in the U.S. It didn't matter. Um, and so just, there was like this bubble of like this own self-sustaining system that was growing and growing and growing. Um, at the same time, the U S was growing. So if we think back really quickly, U S 13 colonies became 13 States and we continued to look westward for more land. Well, why were we looking for more land? Because there were more people here. They wanted more economic opportunity. They wanted to own their own plot to, to make something of themselves. Like, the American dream concept, like that's what all this is and where that all comes from. And as we look, you know, westward, states are being added slowly to the union and there becomes more and more separation between like the North and the South on slavery. Um, there's a rule, um, no, rules aren't the right word. The Missouri Compromise comes into play here, where basically, if there was going to be a new state added to the U.S., and it was going to be a slave state, a free state had to be entered in as well. They wanted to keep things even um, for economic purposes, or not economic, for political purposes, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yep. we want to keep things equal and fair. And I, again, I'm dumbing, dumbing this down for myself. <laughs> like that, you know, if you're more interested in this, like I highly recommend looking into the Missouri compromise. There's a lot of meat. A lot of intricacies that we're not going to dive on. Yes. Like there's a lot of meat to everything that we're saying. So like, please do your own research. This Again, is this is the, uh, this is the talk to talk PhD abbreviated version. <laughs> yes. We'll, we'll give you your certificate online later. <laughs> um, so that's all happening. There's lots of conflict. Highly recommend that you look into into that more if that's something of interest to you. But basically at that point, okay, tick for tack. Everyone, we've got to be equal here. Um, the Southern states start to get a little restless um, and don't think that what's happening in the United States is fair and, um, and that their liberties are being taken away because of these rules. I'm like, is it a slave state? Is it a free state? Right. There's pressure saying like, mm, slavery, like it's not good. So basically the Southern states say, all right, like, fuck this. Like tensions are rising. It's getting really heated. So they eventually say like, fuck it, we're leaving. And here we have the civil war. Um, President Lincoln is also, and there's also like a lot of tension between the presidential race in the 1860s. There, there's a lot of really juicy things. Again, here. So, so many details. Again, you what, you know, like, <laughs> sorry, I'm just like, I just really want to reiterate. So President Lincoln comes in and his entire stance is, listen, I'm pro union, which means I want the U.S. to be together. All these That's states. Like, full One stop. happy family. Like, you know, like we all have our crazy uncles and aunts, like, but let's be one happy let's family. Let's together, family. yeah. Yeah, like full stop. Like that is like when you think of the Lincoln presidency, like that should be what we think about. Um, not necessarily placing him on the pedestal of the great emancipator. Correct. That was a byproduct um, of the rest of his campaign. Correct, correct. So like his, his objective was let's keep everyone together, not let's free the slaves. Eventually he was like, yeah, like let's free the slaves. Like whatever we gotta do to like keep the country together. But the Emancipation Proclamation, which came out in 1863, is a very important document in American history. Do not get me wrong. I'm, I'm not trying to like shit all over the legacy that is Lincoln. I think there were very important and critical things that he did to set people up 
for success um, in this country as best as it could possibly be at the time. Maybe, and maybe I'm being too generous with that. I don't know. Um, but all that being said, he cared more about keeping the country together. It was not, it was not slavery is bad and I'm going to stop slavery. Like the and union, the we are anti-slavery. Like, like, abolishment, like he was not the activist that he's often made out to be. He was not the, like, did not start this war to end slavery. That is the key point here. Correct, the correct, correct. That this, the point of the Civil War, what they were fighting over was to keep the Union a Union and to keep the Southern states from seceding. So we fast forward to, I guess, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation frees the slaves, but like, not really, not, not quite. That it's wasn't- like, It's a really cute, like, half step. It's like- <laughs> I was about to be a major bitch. It's like when a corporate company says like, we're celebrating Juneteenth for the first time ever, where it's like, oh, okay. Like, I, it's good. It's good. Don't get me wrong. It's good. It's it, was good. A, it was a necessary step, but it was a necessary yeah. step that happened way too fucking. Yes. Yes. A necessary step to end a process that should have never been a process at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so again, for finally doing what you should have done 200 years ago. So 18, uh, you have the Emancipation Proclamation, but you still have slaves that were slaves for two extra year, two and a half years beyond January 1st, 1863, when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. It was June 19th, 1865 in Texas when finally Union soldiers reached Texas two and a half years later to say to the last enslaved people that they were free. And that is where the holiday of Juneteenth come, comes from. So June 19th every single year is the, not even the equivalent, it is the Black American Independence Day because there was zero freedom for Black people until the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation and the last slaves were told of their freedom two and a half years later on June 19th, 1865. So for those who don't know what Juneteenth is or have never heard of it before or heard of it for the first time this year, it is Black American independence and it is a celebration. I know that some people, um, especially this year, with it being more in the limelight, we're a little confused on is it something we celebrate versus is it something that is like a somber date? It's not somber at all. It is a full out celebration and should be treated as such. Um, if your company is not treating it as a federal holiday, I know it's legally not a federal holiday, but push for that, push to have that day off and use it as time to celebrate the end of the worst thing that's ever happened in America. Yeah, yeah. Full stop. Let's Full do that. Stop. That's it. Year like in, in, year out. <laughs> Good there. So we can keep moving. <laughs> we can keep moving. <laughs> so great. Juneteenth happens. Everyone's free and they know it now. Yes. What well, are like, you supposed they, to do like, with this new freedom? So you have had no property. You have been property. You have no education. You have no land. You have no jobs. You have no training. But you're you're free to go figure it the hell out and when we get to that point we get to what happens after slavery and it wasn't like it was like 40 acres and a mule was what was promised and it was never given so but that can get into reparations and this whole other part of this conversation that we will have at a later date but from the start there was like a vacuum where blacks were given their freedom but given no resources to actually survive with this freedom right yeah i think the other thing too is like we said like emancipation proclamation is a baby half step like don't get me wrong it's an essential document for this <laughs> the shit show that was created right like but that didn't hold any weight until the 13th amendment was created which right. that is what formally abolished slavery there's like a little baby asterisk we can talk about it another time um, about like prison labor, but formally abolished slavery in the U.S. Um, and like, unfortunately, 
things that were promised, like Jordan mentioned, to set up people for success after everything was taken from them or was, was taken from their ancestors. Because at this point now, there are, Again, are no people that are coming across the Pentecost. There was nothing that they had for they, generations. They didn't know anything else. Like this was, this is your life. This is what you're born into. That you have no choice, no options. That you have nothing. This is what it is. Um, so that all happens. Slavery's ended. But there's nothing for these people to do. They have no skills. They can't read. I mean, think about yourself and just imagine you leaving your home, wherever you are right now, getting taken and just dropped into like the middle of like, I almost said. Whatever the most foreign place is that you can think yeah, of. Yeah, like wherever, wherever, like literally like Syria. Great, boom, you're in Syria. You don't know how to speak the language. You can't read. No one can talk. To, you know, like, and don't get me wrong. Like, these people aren't, aren't you. But, like, it's going to be very hard for you to be successful. No matter how naturally talented and gifted you are at your craft, you know, no matter what, there's, what are you going to do? You're stuck. You're up a creek. And it's going to be very hard for you to be independent and to take care of yourself, right? Well, that's what happened to these people. Um there was this sense of freedom. However, what else were they going to do? Like all they know how to do is what they've been taught, which is probably working in agriculture. Um, and then you, you, you want to take it there. So that's, that's part of it. But with the signing of the 13th amendment and freeing of the slaves, there were still rules and laws that were put into place. Like we can, we oh, can yes. we'll talk about the black yeah. codes and how those, so it went from slavery to the black codes, which were laws that if black people worked really any job other than as a servant or as a farmer, they were fired, fined, and even jailed for doing anything outside of those two things that it was deemed appropriate for black people to do. And that lasted for you know up through the 1940s 50s and then right from there it went to the Jim Crow era which was the same thing just a different form of how it was put into place so yeah I think like continued, continued all the way through yeah, to your point, like black coats, and, and which that's what I mean. Like, what are they going to do except for work agriculture? It's because they have no other skill set, and they were told essentially they could do nothing else. So, when we in future episodes talk about how important your local elections and holding your local government accountable is, it's like it's stuff like this where like these black coats were created by this is not a federal government thing. The federal government says, hey, like you can't own people. Oh, okay, cool. So then all these small towns start making these rules that limit the upward mobility and like the opportunity to achieve independence, financial freedom, and like the American dream. Because, you know, these black people who are former slaves are seen as other. Um, I'm using air quotes because that's like bullshit. Not that I'm like mocking, whatever. Um, I feel like if someone's watching this, they just air quote. Like, air quotes. Air quotes. <laughs> I have a friend who air quotes like this, and it's really, I, it makes me uncomfortable. Um, anyways. I mean, I think this is the perfect time to kind of, all right, so we painted the picture of slavery was fucked up. Everyone who's listening yeah. agrees. If you're listening and you don't agree, rewind it back and listen to this whole thing over again to understand that it was fucked up. And if you know someone who thinks it wasn't fucked up, tell them, hey, listen to this, it was fucked up, okay? So got that, covered that point. We covered why it last, like how it became so big from 1619 when there were 20 slaves to what it ended up being, which was, you know, the backbone for the American economy, which shaped the American geopolitical scene and had impacts globally as well. So we talked about all that, and then we talked about how it eventually ended as a byproduct of the Civil War, which was, had the goal, the Civil War, the goal of the Civil War was to keep the Union together. And as a byproduct, 
slavery was abolished. We talked about the legality of that. And now we're going to talk about was the, we're going to get to the meat of the answer. Wasn't slavery a long time ago? No, it was not a long time ago in the sense of generational impacts. We are going to go step by step, topic by topic on how there are still disparities that relate directly back to the fact that slavery was a thing in America. The first thing we're going to jump into is housing discrimination. Now, again, Blacks were property, not people. Property can't own other property. At least there, I can't think of any situation where that's a thing. So Blacks were not allowed legally to own any property for a very, very long time. When slavery ended, they still had a lot of obstacles in front of them um, after the Procl uh, Emancipation Proclamation, and they were set free, but they still were not given the resources to, one, know how to buy property, and two, to have the resources to actually buy this property. And there were still laws in place in these specific places, like in these specific towns and cities and villages and whatever municipal breakdown that you want to throw out there, there was no option for Black people to purchase properties. And then when there were laws put in place in the civil rights era that you could not discriminate based on color or race anymore, they came up with new ways to do this. So remember, for hundreds of years, Blacks were not allowed to purchase property. Now you were allowed to purchase property, but you had to buy it in red line districts. And what, for anyone who doesn't know what redlining is, it was a real estate practice that literally drew on the map areas. So there were A, B, C, and D class neighborhoods. Blacks were funneled into the D class neighborhoods where A was the most desirable, B was desirable, C was eh, maybe not so desirable, and then D was what was purposely constructed to be the ghetto. And like, that's so literally that's, like the other side of the tracks. That's that that phrase has very strong yes. historical connotations. It was where there were no resources. It was where black people were really forced to live because they were not given any other options. Um, you were restrict like mortgage companies looked at these D-class neighborhoods, these red line districts, as risky investments. So it comes back to economy again. Um, where it's a risky investment, therefore they were less likely to have mortgages in those areas and less likely to give those mortgages to black people, give black people mortgages anywhere outside of those districts. Realtors would show black people only homes in these neighborhoods. And this is even after black soldiers came home from the world wars. They were still, they were promised these opportunities when they were sent away to war. And when they came back, those promises were not fulfilled. Surprise happened again happened again america promising black people something and not coming through on it so with this these black soldiers come back to their families ready to buy into the american dream and finally have a fair shot in america and around this time what was created was an fha loan which for the first time you did not have to have 50 percent of the value of a home you could buy it for as little as 10 or 20 percent which made the home buying opportunity more feasible and, and realistic for people in America because you didn't have to have that large upfront capital. Like, again, who, who can do that now? Like, think about yourself. Like, I'm a millennial. <laughs> I'm never going to own a home. Jordan owns a home and it's gorgeous. But I'm a millennial and I'm never going to own a home. Like, I'm so sorry. Like, I have no money. But 50%? So could, could you know. imagine 50% as opposed to no, which? Down now? No. It, so that was done to give people the opportunity. So that opportunity was still kept from black people all the way through. And there are still companies that get caught up in this today, that get caught up in practicing illegal discrimination in the housing market. So this is not a problem that's, that ended with say, slavery. So in regards to housing discrimination, no, it was not a long time ago. If you look at home ownership from the 2020 census from the first quarter of this year 73.7 percent of white people above a certain age 
own homes. Okay, 77, 73.7%, so almost three quarters of this age demographic for white people own I agree, or I are, what is the age demographic. Sorry, I, I don't mean it's uh it's in the it's in the census. Um, if you want to look it up, I believe it's 25 and over, which is crazy okay, because those people that I know that are 25 did not own a home. So I agree, but I I feel like that's also well, it's like good that's across America because I was like, yeah, who who are these humans? Yeah. I do not. Know. I yeah. mean, like you own a home, but I think you might be one of my only friends that actually owns a house. And again, I don't own it outright, so pay the mortgage. So first quarter <laughs> 2020, 73.7% okay. of white people over the age of 25 or 30 own the home that they live in. That same age group, either 25 or 30 for black Americans, is up. It's up, but it's still only at 44%. Now, I don't know about everyone else, but actually, I do know about everyone else. Housing and home ownership is the most effective and efficient and quick way, quick way to build wealth, okay? Your home becomes like your savings bank. If I'm paying my mortgage month in, month out, and I'm gaining more equity in my home. So as I pay down my mortgage, I have more ownership in my home and therefore more wealth acquired. But the fact that it's only happening for black people at a 44% rate when it's happening for white people at 73.7% rate we have this tie directly back to slavery and housing discrimination, redlining, continuously happening over and over and over again. That again, answers the question, no, slavery was not a long time ago. Boom, this box is checked for housing discrimination. No, slavery was not a long time ago. And what, every homeowner pays taxes, right? We all pay taxes. No matter what. Unfortunately, you have, yes. You have a job, you pay taxes. You don't have a job, you pay taxes. And what do those taxes go to? They're supposed to go to fix the roads. If you've ever driven in Philly, they don't. Potholes everywhere. They're supposed to go into infrastructure. They're supposed to go into sanitation. They're supposed to go to all these different things where taxes are supposed to go. One of which is education. Now, we are going to directly correlate housing discrimination to education. How are we going to do that? I'll show you. Taxes. Tax. So those taxes that you pay on your home and through, like, straight out of your paycheck. So you pay those taxes every two weeks or whenever you get your paycheck. You also pay housing taxes. Home ownership comes with taxes. And when you pay those taxes, it goes to the resources in your neighborhood. Now, it's... The taxes are also based on the value of your home. We're going to go back to redlining quick. The homes that were in those redlined neighborhoods were not desirable homes. Therefore, there was not large demand for those homes. Therefore, there was not a high value on those homes. So the fact that the home value was low then translates to the taxes, the taxed amount of those homes being low. And there is less money going into the resources in that neighborhood. And again, this is all planned out and put into place as processes and systems that are systemic and racist. So as there's less taxes that are going to these schools, they have less resources for teachers, less resources for books, less resources for um, the, to have enough teachers to keep these class sizes small and manageable for the teachers and small and manageable enough that the kids in these classes can actually learn and so that's now, that's right now currently still happening. But how did education kind of go along with all the other issues? Like what processes and systems were in place in the educational process? So we look back and we remember that schools were segregated until not that long ago. Like I doubt that my grandparents would have went to the same school as your grandparents if they lived in the same neighborhood somehow. Yeah, probably not. Most definitely not. It would have been a very, very unlikely occurrence. Um, and that was all the way up through, like, separate but equal. Like, that was the goal of the school system, was to have a black school and a white school, separate but equal. And equal and never happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Literally the first time I got, okay, it's not, it's not ever equal. Listen, no. 
there was no there was no such thing as equality. The white schools would have all of the resources. They would it would purposefully have all of the resources, whereas the black schools had all of the leftovers. So yeah. people started to fight against this system, and the fight made it all the way to the Supreme Court in the case of Brown versus Board of Education. A little, I think she was eight, uh, Linda Brown, her dad wanted her to go to the elementary school that was the white elementary school because they had better resources. He wanted to give his daughter the most resources, just as any parent would want. But this man legally was not allowed to until the Supreme Court finally, again, super late soft clap for finally <laughs> doing something that you should have fucking done from the beginning. <sighs> finally, they ruled that separate but equal was not okay. <laughs> and again, they make a legal change. Okay, so it's no longer legal to have separate but equal schools, but there's very little done to ensure that these schools are equitable for every student, regardless of their color. And we still see the same exact issues today. So yeah. ready? We've connected the fact that discrimination in housing still exists and is steeped in racism. So with slavery a long time ago in regards to housing, no. Was slavery a long time ago in regards to education? No. Caitlin, why do we go to school? And get to an learn. Education? And so then, we get, then we can get a good paying job to take care of ourselves and our family and make meaningful contributions to our society. <laughs> and that's yeah, super like right? altruistic, I know. But like <laughs> <laughs> and that's super, super equal for everyone, right? I mean like in theory but i know based on based on the tone of the podcast i'm gonna guess no no hey um we're gonna we're gonna put a pause on it we're gonna go ahead and take a commercial break because dewey's oh, freaking dewey. out dewey's freaking out oh we'll be, he just wants we'll some right back with you all <laughs> all right and we're back <laughs> um do man's good dewey has do you need to introduce like who Dewey is? Like, is this oh, where Dewey. we have a fun like picture pop up and it's like a pinwheel and it's like we'll have, yeah, we'll have a picture of Dewey pop up. We'll edit that yeah. in. Try to, um, but Dewey's good. We're back to the conversation. So again, we are just normal people having a normal conversation, <laughs> getting interrupted by our normal dogs. Um, so we we're transitioning from <laughs> the discriminatory education practices to another discriminatory practice, which is in employment. Um, so you wanna run with this one, Kay? Um, sure, so what Jordan had been talking about beforehand was is the whole idea of like, isn't slavery, wasn't it a long time ago? And we keep telling you it's, it wasn't, we're still seeing the ripple effects of, of those choices that were made hundreds of years ago today. Um, and we talked about how your housing, where you live, was dictated based on the color of your skin. The quality, receiving education first and foremost was also dictated by the color of your skin. And then like the quality with which like you, what you had in an educational experience was like, did you have a, a great textbook that had all the information in it? Did you have extracurricular activities? Did you who, have- who, both... who wrote that textbook? Oh, I didn't even think about like who wrote the textbook. I would have thought that it was like, here it is, but like, sorry kids you get like the old version of the textbook that's like the, the first edition when we're on like the fifth edition and there's like 40 missing pages was in my head. I, right. who, who would I'm just saying. I, no, that's a fair question. I'm just now. Just getting there. <laughs> just get like, just getting there. And like all the time I just think to myself, like just like by and large in life, like it takes so much energy to be a, a fucking asshole. Like all this stuff, like you're making it hard. Like, we got to make this whole new set of rules because we don't see people equally. Like that just seems like what, what, I mean, like obviously like morally and ethically it is absurd, like absurdist again. It does seem like, like a lot of unnecessary work. It just seems like so much extra like bullshit that you would but have. The, I mean, to do. It comes down, it comes down to the why it happened. It was to oh, for sure. create a sense of privilege and superiority. Yes. And, and just like insecurity for an entire group of people for mm -hmm. sure I know and that's just me in my head with just like with anything like I mean I could be an asshole but like that's 
why <laughs> why okay but anyway sorry employment um so we kind of talked about this earlier where we talked about okay well slavery ended i keep hitting my rings on this table sorry slavery ended cool cool, cool. it should have ended earlier but like thank god we have you know a living document that protects that from ever happening nice unfortunately there was really not a lot of opportunities for formerly enslaved people to do anything other than something similar to what they were already doing, which was probably working in agriculture um, or being a servant, working, working, you know, like um, scullery maid, like things like that, like in a home, but like working in the back of the kitchen or linens, like a maid type thing. Um, and, and those people who did that were few and far between and seen as another separate subgroup of, of people. Um, but that being said, so you couldn't really do a whole lot. Like people weren't going to say like, okay, well, cool. Like I always wanted to be a dentist. So now I'm going to go to dental school. I'm assuming dental school existed in 1860s, 1870s. Sure. Right. So like, cool. Like I'm going to go be a dentist now. Like that was not an opportunity that someone. But you, could, so you say like going to be a dentist in the 1860s, but like, I don't know what year the first black dentist was a oh, thing, yes. but the fact that we still have the first black anything is still a problem in 2020. Um, if yes. you think back to the first black president, <laughs> like, we were all we were all alive for that in in 2000, 2008. Like it's not like we have gotten so far removed that we're not still having to have that qualifier for the first black this or the first black female this like still going on so right also the, just sidebar so yeah. everyone knows the first black dentist according to google is robert tanner freeman freeman emerged from poverty to become the first professionally trained black dentist he entered harvard medical school in 1864 or what sorry 67 i can't read four years after the civil war ended okay sidebar i i just arbitrarily said dentistry <laughs> I'm really happy that happened. But by and large, that was not a normal thing. Um, so Jordan and I had talked about it. Black codes were established, and then those transitioned into Jim Crow laws. So half step back, what are black codes? They were rules that restricted the job and profession and career that a formerly enslaved person or black person could have. Um, and like I said, guess what? pre-slavery or during slavery, you were probably working in the fields. And let's say like you were at a cotton plantation. Great. After you're freed, you're probably doing the same thing, potentially working for, <laughs> working for the same person that you'd been working for, potentially for your entire life. Um, That's your there family was no, for their whole lives. And your right. Family. Yes. 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 Again, there was no, no opportunity for upward mobility. There were no resources given to you. It was just, hey, here you go, figure it out. And there's nothing they could do. Um, and, and you had these landowners who were saying, listen, c come on, like, we'll give you a place to live. It was literally the same place that they were already living. Like the slave quarters that they used to live in were now their homes. I, again, I'm using air quotes, like what in the world? So those positions were still limited to people, to black people, and to formerly enslaved people. There was no real, and our, our friend Robert, the first uh, black dentist is an exception, but th there were a few people who had the opportunity to go and move forward into something else. Um, if you broke these rules, guess what? There were punishments for you breaking these black codes, which were mm -hmm. jail time, paying a fine was like, what salary are you making? Also the salaries that these people were making were next to none because they got the privilege to live back on the land that they'd already lived on right. and worked on for years. So the idea of like, well, you have a job now, you can make m money and an income. That's not, that's not really true. That's a far cry from like, if we're going to call that, we talk now about like a livable wage. We think it it's bad now. Even a conversation. Not, not even a conversation or something it's that we can like, then. Right. This is just what it was. Hey, listen, now good for you. You're free. You can earn an income. We're going to make it so minimal that 
there's nothing for you to do. There's nothing to have, no way for you to help support your children. Your children are just going to have to start doing this job now. Um, so then that's black codes. And then we transitioned into Jim Crow, um, which was essentially the rebirth of discriminatory practices. So racism um, doesn't, it doesn't go away. It just changes its shape. It just, yes, it literally just morphs itself. It was originally slavery and then it turned into black code and then it turned into Jim Crow. And now we're in what I would consider like this weird post Jim Crow, like criminal uh, prison incarceration phase of whatever. We can talk about that at a later date, but um, back to Jim Crow it's the same, the same core thought of an us versus them mentality. If you are black, you are not good enough. You have to be separated from us. You're not going to be given the, op the same opportunities. Um, and this was the way that it was until the civil rights act in 1964. Um, you were just destined to, like we were talking about with housing, like live on the other side of the tracks. You were living there because you couldn't get a job that paid you more. You couldn't get a job that paid you more because the schools that you went to for sundry reasons didn't support your growth and development as a person to then get into a university system. You know, like every single step of the way, if you are a black person, you were set up at an unfair playing, you're not on the same playing field, basically. Like every step of the way, generationally, generationally, as I stutter, since the beginning of, since 1619, you were literally just up a creek without a paddle and that was just supposed to be the way it was because of the color of your skin. Exactly, exactly. And then we talk about employment, we talk about two reasons that you have a job. One is salary, so you have money to pay for things. And the other often is healthcare. So health, okay, so we, we already checked the box, discrimination in housing, discrimination in education, discrimination in employment, and we're gonna go into discrimination in healthcare. And this goes all the way back directly to slavery. Slaves did not have healthcare. Like it wasn't like a slave broke his or her, her bone working, they didn't have workman's comp, they didn't have a doctor. They didn't have Aflac. No, they had none of that, <laughs> they had none of that. They literally, maybe a bandage, maybe a little sling, and get back out there. Like, and yeah, your expectation was still to be as productive and whatever productive looked like given your role, even if you, you oh, I'm sorry you broke your arm, well you still better pick as much cotton. Because as remember, cotton. You, when you when you're a slave black person you are not a person at all you are a piece of property at this point you are just damaged goods and if there was health care provided it was not for you it was so that you could get back to making me or the white owner money so that's what the health care was focused on when there was health care um reminds me of a quote from mlk um of all forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. So not even having the basic protection of your own body, that was not afforded to, to black people in America. And that continued in the sense that they didn't have proper nutrition, they didn't have proper sleep, they didn't have the proper clothing and equipment to go out and work the fields. They were giving rags and tattered clothing to go out and do what was taxing, demanding, and sometimes dangerous work. Um, they had excessive labor demands for all these. And the unsanitary circumstances and lack of health care that they did have led to what were called Negro diseases. I'm going to read through a list of what were these quote-unquote Negro diseases that they happen very frequently in black enslaved people because of the situations. It wasn't that they were naturally more uh, susceptible to these. It was that they were exposed because of their situation to these diseases. So tetanus, higher infant, infant mortality rates, worms, diphthermia, typhoid, tuberculosis, influenza, hepatitis, rheumatism, scabies, psoriasis, leprosy, syphilis, and like that's just 
what we were, what I was very quickly able to pull up as far as what were considered Negro diseases, um, the list keeps going. And that list translates to today where black people are more at risk for heart disease, obesity, um, black women are significantly more likely than other, uh, any other race of women to have certain cancers, uh, specifically breast cancer. Breast cancer in the black community is a very, very, it's a, it's a, it happens at a very, very high rate. And it all stems back to the lack of healthcare at slave times all the way through. And then you wanna talk about um, the hospitals that slaves did have. Like I said, they were, it was basically treating like your car was broken. You're in, you're out, you're fixed, and you're put back out for, for your use and your purpose, which was to be property. Um, and then the experimentation that happened on especially black women. So gynecology and female health is very complicated when done correctly. And when you're using people as experiments, it can go catastrophically wrong. So there were, there's two pieces that we have to touch on before we move off of healthcare um, for black females. They were used experimentally in the sense that they were, they were tested on, procedures were tested on them, drugs were tested on them, and that was one part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that this was done to control the black population as well. Like it, there were very young, young girls who were forever sterilized, could never have kids, could never pass on what was believed and portrayed to be a dangerous race. It was better to get rid of the possibility that these black women would have more black children. And then there was an entire narrative created off of that that still has generational impacts today. So yes, healthcare is another one where we can easily check the box that was slavery a long time ago when it comes to healthcare. No, it was not. And I would say like, like the other thing with like healthcare too, um, that is still an issue today, like a significant issue is, um, and I'll speak again more specifically to women because I just know that more, um, but I'm not a black woman, but I care a lot about gynecological health and female health. No offense more than male health. Um, makes sense. You know, I've just looked into it a little bit more. Just, it makes a little bit more sense for me and my journey, I guess. Um, but one thing that's always been very shocking to me is, and again, it's just one of those things I, I can't wrap my head around why it's this way, but, um, like black women are perceived to have a higher like threshold for pain. I, again, I'm using air quotes cause it's all like fucking bullshit, like a higher threshold for pain. Therefore, like during something like terribly pain, I, I don't have children. So like during something that I can imagine only to be like the worst pain that I could possibly feel, which is birthing a child, like their care of treatment could be very different than like if I were to have a child, you know, like we could be on the same floor, but there's an opportunity and like a potential that like I could be offered an epidural, whereas someone may not like, and I'm not an epidural, like I'm sure most people are offered that if they want it, but by and large, like my range of treatment could look incredibly differently incredibly because, different. because of the color of my skin. And there are, and we're, ta we're talking today, present day. No, we're talking today. 19, um, today. Serena Williams, when she was having her pregnancy issues, I, like, I won't go into like, in depth and what they were, but she was, she had to be an advocate for herself because her physician, like she was having issues with her pregnancy. And like, let, let me be clear, like having a, growing a human is like fucking hard. And like, there's a lot of issues that arise when you're doing something like that to your body, even though women do it every single day and they've mm -hmm. done it since the beginning of like the human race, like shit happens and shit goes wrong. And I cannot imagine like how incredibly isolating and frustrating and scary it must be when there's something going on with your body and you have the person that you're supposed to trust most in this situation, which is your physician and your nurse. Not staff, acting in your remember. own interest because of the cause. Yes. And like when you have to raise your hand and say like, I feel like something is wrong and people aren't listening or like don't believe that there's something like, oh, no, 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 
no, no, it's just whatever, whatever, whatever. And you have to keep advocating for yourself with stuff like preeclampsia, which is super common and like, mm -hmm. whatever. I just, I think that's like its own conversation and like point, but it still happens today. And it happens to, and, and not to say that like a celebrity is more important than so, you know, your next door neighbor, which, okay. I think what it says is that it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter. Yeah what status you reach as a black person the first thing about you is that you are black right right it's it's not that you're literally one of the best female athletes in the entire world and that you, you can have the you've got like the financial freedom that a lot of people do not have so therefore you would think that like okay like if you have the money you you've got the income check you know you have a great you have education, celebrity you, like you, have status, status. you have all of it right that like but that, it was a big news story, like a couple years, last, was it last year or two years? I can't remember, but that was a big news story. It was like the difficulties with her pregnancy and like the, the roadblocks that she was hitting because of that. So it's still an issue today. So check. So check. So all I have to say, <laughs> check. Now the last, last piece of evidence that slavery was not that long ago was, uh, that was mentioned previously was policing. Now, we're not going to dive super far into this because our next two episodes are about policing in America, um, but we will just start it and end it with police in America were started as slave patrols, okay? So it was not always an organized um, job. It wasn't even a job previously. Um, it was created to catch runaway slaves, bring them back to whoever owned them because they were property. And it evolves from there, but those were the roots. We're gonna dive deeper into that in episode two and episode three. So we're gonna go ahead and just leave that there for you. And we're gonna go a ahead- A little nugget, a little teaser. Little teaser, little teaser. So we're gonna go ahead and get to the point. We're gonna wrap this one up. Um, so to answer the question, was slavery a long time ago? Let's say it all together on one, two, three. Hell no. no. Oh, I like your no better than my no. How <laughs> many no, slavery was not a long time ago, okay? Um, now, we don't want to ever just send you away with just the answer to the question. We're going to give you resources and other ways to continue this conversation, continue this topic. So, um, Caitlin, first we're going to go ahead and give a a resource for this week. What is it? What do we got? Okay. I feel like this is like an official timeout. Do we not want to do like the fun thing about the school thing? Oh, I almost forgot <laughs> our, our first segment. Our brand new segment on our brand new show. Oh, good catch. Do you, do you remember that one time that we spent a long time organizing this whole thing and talking about it and then we just like decided to not? <laughs> I, was, I was like, are we playing yeah, audible and just like, I did that. Okay, All right, great. so great. introduce introduce what the segment is. Okay, so I, I, I'm envisioning air horns or like, I want like a special noise effect to come in when we talk about this. <laughs> You're the editor and like the podcast guru, so I don't know, make it happen. We'll figure that out. So um, welcome to a little baby segment that we're gonna do every single episode called What You Didn't Learn in School. I feel like through conversations that Jordan and I have had and like, other friends of mine, like I have a, a girlfriend that I met in college and we were talking about like what we learned about slavery um, in, at like a high school level. And like she grew up outside of Philadelphia and I grew up in North Carolina, like vastly different. And I would say like, it wasn't even that like, I'm like a huge nerd. Like I know what I am. I'm a nerd. It wasn't <laughs> that like, oh, well I was in like AP US history and like you weren't. No, it was like, she just didn't learn about this type of stuff. So through all of that, we wanted to have this segment, What You Didn't Learn in School, where we just provide like a little extra layer of context to what we're talking about. Um, again, just to inform you, and if anyone ever has questions about why <laughs> Black Lives Matter, why you think this is important, or like how to use this in a conversation. Like it's just a different, a, a different little thing that we can chat about each week. No doubt. So welcome to what you didn't learn in school. This week's topic 
in the segment, what you didn't learn in school is black recolonization. What the heck is that? Because you didn't learn it in school, we're going to educate you today. So we, we gave our critique of how history paints Abraham Lincoln, and we're going to go a little bit deeper into that. So we discussed earlier in the show how the Civil War was originally about keeping the Union together, keeping the, the northern states connected to the southern states and keeping it as one nation as opposed to a northern United States and a southern United States as two separate entities. That, the, the North won the war. Sorry for anyone who's listening and thinks that the South did. It didn't. Just didn't happen. You need to learn a lot more in school. <laughs> we, we've got to cover some other things. But North wins the war, the Union stays together, and as a byproduct, slavery is no longer a thing. There was discussion as early as 1854 involving, before he was president, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the first time that he ever mentioned this black recolonization is. He was president. Huh? He was president. 1854? Oh, I thought you said 64. I'm no, no, no. so 54. sorry. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> 54. I'm so in a, sorry. In You're a, not wrong. I just can't listen. Yeah, you just didn't. I was I wasn't speaking loudly enough, I guess. I was getting I was getting in my teacher voice. Um, 1854 <laughs> in a small town in Illinois is the first that I could find in my research of Abraham Lincoln putting out this idea that yes, slavery should be illegal but what do we do with the black people once they're freed from slavery? I have this idea. We will take them, put them on boats and send them somewhere else because there's no way that blacks and whites can live together peacefully. So there was, it wasn't just Abraham Lincoln. There was an entire society and it was called the American Colonization Society. It was made up of people who were not necessarily abolitionists, but were against slavery and did not see blacks and whites as equal but wanted slavery to end because they thought it was wrong but they didn't want blacks and whites to live in an equal society so that was one one group of people those people teamed up with the slave owners of the south usually and wanted to take all the freed black people everyone who was already free and put them on these same boats and send them somewhere else because they found that they thought that freed black people undermined the institution of slavery. So you have the president before he was president supporting this, you have people who are against slavery supporting this, and you have people that um, are slave owners supporting this for all different reasons, all different motives, but that is the triumvirate of people that are involved in this, um, this black recolonization idea. Um, they wanted to send blacks back to Liberia. They wanted to send blacks to Haiti. They wanted to send blacks to Panama, Belize, other Central American countries. And there was actually one ship that was sent to Haiti with, I believe, 500, 500 now freed black people, air quotes again, black people on it. Caitlin alluded to it before that these slave ships were not great situations at all. Disease broke out. Um, people died when the, uh, the new colonists, I guess, of Haiti, these freed black people got to Haiti. They had none of the resources they needed. They had basically the same situation that they had in America, just uprooted and put into a new geographical place. Um, and this is the first and only ship that made it to Haiti. Um, it was so bad that the survivors were eventually a ship was sent for them and they were taken back to New York City and like wipe your hands, nothing ever happened. We tried it, it didn't work. And that's pretty much where that idea of black recolonization ended. Um, it started to lose support from people who were promoting it that were slave owners because it was happening now that slavery was ending. So they didn't they didn't give a shit where the black people went after that. They just wanted to maintain slavery. And like the whole idea just completely fell apart. Um, they were forced to trade in their their metallic money for paper money for the land proprietor that was in Haiti and basically put pump a bunch of money into him and his resources went up while theirs were depleted. It's the same thing that happened 
in America happens in America and has continued to happen. Um, but yeah, so there is the this week's the first inaugural what you didn't learn in history black recolonization you got anything to add on it Kay? no i i think that's great i this came up because jordan and i were talking because i made the point when we were going through like what this first episode was going to look like and what should we hit on from like our american history and we were talking about like i was like yeah like we need to make sure that everyone knows like keeping the union together was the most important thing for Lincoln and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, oh, well, yeah. I'm like, when you talk about black recolonization, I was like, what? And again, to the point of like, we all learned different things for various reasons. Um, whether it be like from our parents or our community or our schools, like I, I hadn't learned that. And I was really su surprised maybe isn't the right word. I would, well, I was shocked that we didn't talk about it in our class at all. I'm also so sorry, Mr. Browning, if like we did and I just <laughs> paid attention all day. But um, I thought it was super interesting. I think it's really important to know and understand to the points we talked about before where like this whole idea of like an us versus them like is so dangerous and is so, but also so entrenched. Like even the people that we think were like trying to free slaves like were they promoting equal you know like were they doing things for like equality and equity um mm -hmm. of people like when you see something like you learn about something like this you're like mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. uh, i would have to say no yeah, <laughs> like exactly it just shows how deeply this is like entrenched like i said entrenched in our history um and we need to unlearn it yesterday yeah but you can Unlearn what you, you can. You have to know, you have to want to do the education. So, for right. those who want to continue their education after this episode, um, we want you for this week. The actionable next step is to watch the 13th. It's a documentary on Netflix. You can find it on YouTube for free. If for some possible reason you don't have a Netflix login, which I can't imagine too many people at this point don't, especially this deep into quarantine. Uh, you, can <laughs> watch it. you can actually watch it for free on YouTube. Um, so you don't even need the Netflix login. It's a documentary about the 13th Amendment. It touches on a lot of the things that we discussed today, how practices and systems that were put in place before us are always continuing to change and shift and have an impact on our society today. Um, and we want you to go out and have a conversation. So find a friend, find a family member, find someone to share this episode with, share this podcast with, share what you learned from listening to us today and continue to do that. Continue to challenge each other and continue to talk